Okay, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Kaya. Um, as Mark said, I'm a postdoc in Martha Bullock's lab at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And I'm very excited to be here, at least virtually, to introduce our excellent speakers in the second session, which is titled Analyses of Genome Structure and Function. So I think the central aspect of biology that motivates me personally, and I think a lot of the work we're going to hear about today, is the regulation of gene expression. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, every cell in the human body has roughly the same DNA, but different cells are able to turn on different genes. And the question is really, how does that happen? How do different cells with the same DNA turn on different genes? Um, and the answer is complicated, but it involves uh, this concept called epigenetics, um, which is the idea that you can sort of change genome structure and organization and genome state with all, all, without altering the underlying DNA code. Um, and that results in these differences uh, can then eventually result in differences in gene expression. Um, and so because of this like central question, a lot of work over the past few years has been put in to attempt to map the epigenetic landscapes of cells. Um, so that includes techniques to map things like DNA methylation, DNA accessibility, histone modifications, uh, and DNA 3D structure. Um, and while the details of those different techniques obviously vary depending on what the goal of the assay is, they all work by kind of enriching for a, a given type of DNA state uh, or a given confirmation that uh, DNA is in and then sequencing that state using next generation sequencing approaches that we've heard a lot about this morning. Uh, and then by aligning the resulting DNA sequencing reads to the genome across many, many samples, you can get a feel for how things like you know, DNA accessibility or histone modifications uh, can change across different cell types. Um, and ultimately, usually the question we want to ask is like, what effect does this DNA state, say DNA accessibility or methylation, have on gene expression? Um, so on the act of transcription, making DNA into RNA. So to begin to try to untangle that, we, we perform these types of correlative analyses where you look at the effect of um, DNA and the effect of RNA and try to correlate the effect of epigenetic states with transcriptomic readouts. Um, so this type of cataloging work has been super useful. It has been famously the goal of the ENCODE consortium for decades now, or I guess a, at least a decade now. Uh, so their goal is to make an encyclopedia of DNA elements in the human genome. And to accomplish this, a number of labs across the world have been performing these various types of assays like chip seq, bisulfite sequencing, RNA sequencing uh, on numerous types of samples for over a decade. And as of uh, 2022, or as of literally yesterday, when I checked the ENCODE website, there are over 16,000 experiments that are available on their website for our perusal. Um, and I'm sure if you polled most scientists listening to this session today, or human genomicists at least, almost 100% of them have used ENCODE data at some point in their research. So these catalogs are, of course, super useful. Um, but the truth of the matter is they're currently a bit limited, and today uh, we're going to hear from three speakers that I think are really working to make these data that exist currently a little bit more representative of the immense complexity that is encoded in the human genome. So the first way that most catalogs uh, are limited is that the majority of them use this bulk sequencing approach, which really can obscure complexity. Um, so to use this incredible analogy that I found on Twitter, <laughs> imagine that this bowl of fruit contains like complex tissue components, so different types of cells. When we do bulk RNA or DNA sequencing, we mash up all of that fruit cells uh, into a smoothie, sequence it, and then hope that the smoothie is kind of like vaguely representative of the original bowl of fruit. But obviously we are collapsing a lot of information that was originally in this bowl of fruit when we make the smoothie. Um, but now, you know, it's, it's almost routine to be able to sequence cells one at a time in single cell sequencing approaches. So um, this means that we can recapitulate with pretty high confidence what the uh, different fruits were, so what the different cells were uh, that were originally in the bowl using these types of techniques. And you can even take the analogy a little bit further and imagine that you know, the whole intact tissue uh, itself is a nice fruit tart uh, and even higher resolution techniques, techniques such as spatial RNA sequencing can allow us to start reconstructing the uh, fruit tart. 
Um, and yeah, so by mapping the epigenetic landscape at single cell resolution, we can more faithfully resolve the complexity of multicellular life. And today we're going to hear a talk from Sanjay Srivatsan at the University of Washington about uh, the promise of single cell sequencing and how it can inform our understanding of developmental processes. So that will be great. Uh, and so the second way that these catalogs are, are a little bit incomplete is that they typically use short read sequencing, which we heard a lot about this morning. These reads can span, you know, 500 bases, but our DNA chromosomes are much longer than that. Now, with the promise of long read sequencing, we can get a lot more information um, out of DNA. And in particular, another feature uh, of nanopore sequencing that's really exciting is that we're able to read out epigenetic states like DNA methylation directly using um, these nanopore techniques. Uh, so today, we're later today, we're going to hear from Gong Feng at Mount Sinai about how his lab uses long read sequencing to study um, differential methylation, which can lead to a more complete understanding of epigenetics. And then finally, as I, as I alluded to earlier, um, most catalogs are inherently correlative, the ones that we have right now. So they correlate the presence or absence uh, of a given epigenetic mark with changes in gene expression using RNA sequencing, which makes teasing out cause and effect a little bit challenging. And so what would be really awesome is if there were more ways to directly perturb chromatin state um, which would allow us to identify whether these epigenetic states themselves can cause changes in gene expression. Uh, and today we're going to hear from Lakra Bintu at Stanford, who I believe is going to tell us about work her lab is doing to develop tools to attempt to directly perturb uh, chromatin states. So um, that is my short little intro to the session. Here's the schedule. Uh, I will be reminding the speakers at like five minutes uh, that you have five minutes left. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to our first speaker, who is Lafra Bintu from Stanford. <laughs> 